Uh, I'm Weijin Ko. I recently joined the NCCN as its Chief Medical Officer, and I'm very grateful that all of you are here to uh, join us in our next session, this roundtable discussion on emerging issues in oncology. Now, I know that Dr. Cliff Goodman doesn't require introduction to most of you. In fact, he prohibited me from reading his bio. But I would say that uh, I have learned that he is one of those unique individuals who can listen, read, synthesize, engage, and talk all at the same time. And uh, we're so grateful that he's here to moderate this panel. We want to thank, uh, NCCM would like to thank the sponsors of this particular session, uh, making this available. All right, well, you just heard a great story about not only one patient's journey, but about how the healthcare delivery system at Moffitt and elsewhere actually had to adapt in real time. Uh, so not only was the patient telling his story over a series of, of, of events and so forth, but we heard about how the institution, led by some pretty talented nurses, oncology nurses, really helped rebuild the system as it went along and continued to do so. Now, what you didn't hear about that much or at all really was the financial side of this, the economic side of it, and that's part of what we're going to get into here. So our title here for this session is Emerging Issues on Oncology, Ensuring Access to and Delivery of, and I might add payment for, Innovative Therapies and Patient-Centered Care in Oncology. Uh, we're going to start out with innovation more broadly, and then we're going to use the CAR-T instance to really zero in on some of the key issues that arise, not only in the form of CAR-T, but some other kind of innovative therapies. Uh, just a little time check for everybody, because uh, we keep it tight here. We're going to run this session until 11, 11 o'clock. At about 10.35, or a little bit after, we're going to take audience questions from our floor mics, and I'm sure that those audience questions will not be short speeches, but they will be really brilliant questions. We're looking forward to that at about 10.35. Um, I do want to also say that some of the areas that we intend to cover are as follows. We're going to try to fit these in, something about innovative therapies more broadly, then dive into CAR-T, and we'll look at CAR-T from the standpoint of moving from clinical trials to the real world. We're going to take a look at CAR-T from the standpoint of things like national coverage decisions made by Medicare that would apply nationally. We're going to take a more careful look at CAR-T and patient reported outcomes and the role of PROs in clinical trials as well. And then we're going to try to fit in some time on how the heck do you pay for this stuff in the form of perhaps alternative payment models. There's a lot of activity there. So that's what we're going to try to cover today. It's packed. We're going to go straight and hard to 11 o'clock uh, with your cooperation. I want to ask, starting with audience far right, for each of our panels to introduce himself or herself, your, basically your name, title, and why it is you find yourself on a panel of this topic. Leyland. Leyland Wolfong, I'm a medical oncologist with Texas Oncology. I am the vice president of our quality programs and value-based care initiatives. Um, I also work with McKesson Specialty Health as the Pathways Task Force Chair and a value-based care physician liaison to other McKesson practices. And I think I'm here because I spend a lot of time thinking about how do we deliver good quality care in a community-based setting. Excellent. Thanks, Leyland. John. Uh, John Sweetenham. I'm a physician-in-chief at the uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah, uh, medical oncologist with an interest in lymphoma. Um, I think I'm here because at uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute, we've spent a lot of time integrating uh, patient-reported outcomes into our clinical workflows uh, and making them part of our kind of routine uh, within all of our outpatient clinics, and I think that's the main reason I'm here. Excellent. Thanks very much, John. Jen. Hi, Jennifer Malin. Good morning, everyone. I'm a medical oncologist and senior medical director for oncology and genetics at United Healthcare. And I think I'm here because I spend most of my days trying to think about how we ensure our members have access to quality care, how we ensure access to innovative therapies for the right patients, and how do we pay for it all. Excellent. Thanks very much. And could you reintroduce yourself, Dr. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hello. My name is Fred Locke. Hello again. Uh, I am the Vice Chair of the Department of Blood Marrow Transplant and Cellular Immunotherapy at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, co-leader of the immunology program at Moffitt. I believe I'm here because we have built uh, rather rapidly at Moffitt one of the largest immune cell therapy programs, uh, which is able to deliver innovative cellular immunotherapies 
uh, for our patients, whether it be on clinical trial or now as a standard of care. And I act as the research director and medical director uh, for both that clinical service and the, the clinical trial office group that runs those trials. Great. Thank you very, very much. And then Stephanie, and if you wouldn't mind, Stephanie, maybe tell us a little bit about how you got here and your special story. Yeah, so I'm Stephanie Joho. I am a stage four colorectal cancer survivor. I'm here only due to immunotherapy and a clinical trial in immunotherapy. Um, I was diagnosed with um, a pretty advanced stage two malignancy um, when I was 22 years old. I have something called Lynch syndrome, which as some of you might know, is a genetic hereditary disorder that significantly raises um, your risk of certain cancers. Um, that stage two quickly turned into stage four after a pair of surgeries and horrific chemotherapy, both the full Fox and full Fury regimens. Um, I was basically sent home with no further options at that point. This was in the summer of 2014. Um, my little sister went home and scoured the internet and refused to accept that this was the end of my story. And she ended up finding um, an incredible clinical trial that was being run at Johns Hopkins that was investigating MSI um, and anti-PD-1 inhibition. Uh, thankfully, I was entered into the trial. And um, long story short, it worked beautifully. Within three months, my uh, previously inoperable tumor had shrunk by 65%. And within a little bit over a year, there has been no evidence of disease since then. So I am, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah, it's still surreal. So um, just like my other fellow patient on the panel earlier, it has been a miracle treatment for me. I now spend my time um, advocating for other patients, advocating for clinical trials, advocating for funding, um, and that is why I'm here today, I think. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And I might add that I know quite well that you're active, uh, you're really big in the patient advocacy community, so you've kind of taken off from your personal experience, changed career paths, and you're a leading spokesman nationally for, the, for this issue. So thank you very much for being here. Before we dive into CAR T in particular, I want to ask, starting with, uh, I want to go uh, John and then Leyland and perhaps Fred to chime in. Where are we more broadly with truly innovative, cutting edge, disruptive, different mechanism of action stuff in cancer? John? So, you know, I, I, I think my answer to that would be fairly broad. I think from the perspective of innovative therapies, I mean, clearly we've already heard this morning a lot about manipulation of the immune system in the context of CAR-T, checkpoint inhibitors, and so on. And I think that, that clearly is a, a huge area of innovation. I think it's also important not to forget uh, the contribution that's been made by new molecularly targeted agents, small molecules, particularly oral therapies. You know, in my world of lymphoma, we're starting to see chemotherapy-free frontline regimens now for a number of different types of lymphoma, which is truly remarkable. I think in, in a broader context, you know, I'd argue that um, issues such as the affordable health care and Medicaid expansion are innovations in cancer care too. You know, we're starting to see improved access to cancer care in populations, more frequent early diagnosis of cancer, uh, more effective prevention strategies, and I would look upon those as real innovations in cancer care as well. And on the other end of the continuum, I'd say our recognition of overuse of uh, ineffective therapies at the end of life has been another very important innovation. Um, so I think it's fairly broad in terms of new innovations, but therapeutically it's the immun immunological world, I think, and like I said, small molecules. Well, I really appreciate your point about how innovation from the kind of molecular biology side has spurred innovation in delivery and payment as well. So it's had a knock-on effect, which is quite interesting. Leyland, can you add to that, please? Um, Definitely. Uh, when I started on the Pathways Task Force uh, about 10 years ago for McKesson Specialty Health, it was pretty easy. Um, we didn't have a lot to talk about um, when our calls lasted about an hour. Um, sometimes we'd skip months because there wasn't really anything new. Um, now we've expanded our calls to two hours every month. Um, and I'm like, we need to split our panels now into two different groups because uh, there's so much to review and talk about, which is great. Our lung cancer pathway went from a pretty simple document um, with 
you know, a very simple carbotaxol first line therapy, and then who knew after that, um, to now we have multiple different uh, algorithms depending on the molecular mutations um, of the patient and then what happens third, fourth line, and before third, fourth line was never given. So it is, there is a significant amount of innovation out there. Um, I would suffice to say, though, that for that innovation, there has been some tremendous innovation for some patients um, who are clearly living longer and better quality lives. Uh, some of the innovation is, in, is very incremental um, and small. And so, although there is a lot of new drugs being developed and a lot of new drugs being approved, few of them have significant impact on patients' outcomes. Uh, we're seeing much more incremental benefit uh, than we are significant benefit. Excellent. Thank you very much. Fred, anything to add? I know you talked about CAR-T, but take the bigger picture. Yeah, I think um, in my world, I'm focused on uh, immune cell therapies, not just CAR-T, but other immune cell therapies. And I think there's a lot of innovative work going on in that space, particularly for solid tumors and other blood cancers. And in order for those things to come forward, to go through pivotal clinical trials, to lead to FDA approvals, it requires a lot of investment. There's a lot of investment in the early stage trials, but the pivotal trials really need investors who can see an FDA approved agent that they can get reimbursed for. And I think, uh, to John's point, we need to figure out the reimbursement models. We need to figure out new ways to pay for these therapies so that we, can, we don't stifle the development as well. Good point, thank you very much. So there's this whole sort of panoply of innovative therapies coming along, entirely different mechanisms of action, entirely different delivery models, sometimes changing the site of care, and as pointed out already, prompting changes, necessary changes in how we think about paying for this stuff. So innovation really, it is that pebble in the pond that has very broad implications as well. One of the things we'd like to get into next, and this was initiated a bit by uh, Dr. Backer and um, Alex Bopier, is kind of the difference between outcomes and patient experience in clinical trials and in the real world. And uh, Frederick, if you just return to that point, uh, to kind of bridge from your discussion before, can you summarize a few of the ways in which that experience might differ? And I'm going to certainly ask Stephanie what she thinks about that. Yeah, I mean, a, a clinical trial, you're trying something out. You, you don't know if it will work, especially with a very innovative therapy like CAR T-cell therapy. We didn't create CAR T-cell therapy at Moffitt. We started off with those multi-center trials. And as Alex outlined, a clinical trial coordinator isn't a nurse. And so uh, we really had to work hard to integrate those therapies into our standard uh, cancer care model. And um, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of organization uh, to do that and um, it can be done and, and will be done. Okay, Stephanie, I know that you kind of got into this from the clinical trial standpoint, but you've made some keen observations about how those worlds might differ in part. For sure, I mean, I think for one, um, I had the unique experience where my clinical trial actually did feel like standard of care, I think just because my physicians were so wonderful and I did have two rock star oncologists who were running the study, so. Um, and it was an investigator-led study, which I think is also an important distinction. Um, so I did kind of feel like the process once I was in the trial was seamless, but the process getting into the trial was pretty difficult, just in terms wow. of approvals, of getting, um, transferring records, transferring tumor samples, whatever it was to the different institutions. So at that point, I had been to quite a few. Um, so that was not a smooth ride in the beginning. No, it was about a five-week process, which when you're about ready for hospice is not really something that you have, you know, five weeks could be life and death for people, and oftentimes it actually is. You were, um, you were on the verge of hospice when this was happening? Yes. I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. I was basically taking like an insane amount of narcotics for my pain, and I was, you know, really below any good weight for myself. I was like less than 100 pounds, so it was a dire situation and we didn't really have that time to wait, but the bureaucracy of getting into trials and checking off all the boxes and having everything in place takes a while. Um, so that to me was the biggest difference. Obviously also um, getting more vials of blood taken all the time and just different things being poked and prodded were probably standard of care. Well, I know standard of care that wouldn't have been as required. So it's more of the day to day that feels different, but I think my general care, um, if anything, was 
actually a lot better because we're all on the same team, right? We're all working towards the same goal. In now, trial. given your experience in talking to others, does that shift at all when it's not a clinical trial setting? Would you expect it to change? With innovative therapies? Or yes, and moving from a clinical trial setting to what we call real world setting. Yeah, I do think that's different. I think people are less under a microscope um, mm -hmm. when they're not in clinical trials. I think things fall by the wayside, and it's, it's, it's a difficult process in general to keep up with your own care. I mean, I, it's been a difficult transition for me, for sure, now not being on a trial. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. John, I know that you're familiar with this as well. What can you say about that shift or the difference between the clinical trial setting and the real world setting? Yeah, so I think at the moment the, 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 the real world term is being a little bit overused. Um, you know, I think that uh, there is this growing um, use of what's called real world evidence in place in some cases of clinical trials as a comparative population for approval of new drugs, which I think you know, is a very specifically derived data set. Um, certainly at the uh, ASH meeting at the end of last year, I saw some quote, quote unquote real world data presented on CAR T cell therapy for patients receiving commercial product off clinical trial. And you know, these were mostly patients with a median age of around late 50s or 60s with a good performance status. It is not the real world of diffuse large B cell lymphoma that I see in my clinic. And so I think to, to Leyland's point, you know, as these new innovative therapies make their way from the clinical trial into a more general population, I think we have to be a little bit careful about assuming that that means that they've reached kind of real world status. Because uh -huh. I think there's a very big gap between those initial patients who get treated on these and the real world in my case of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, where I, I think it, a big proportion of these patients are never going to have access to that kind of therapy for whatever reason. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, Leyland, what would you anticipate, whether for CAR T or other innovative therapies, as patients, as the delivery system deals with the clinical trial rigors and framework, and again, the community setting? So it differs on the different therapies. Um, you know, some immunotherapy, some therapies like the immunotherapy uh, you received are fairly easy to incorporate into our clinical workflows. Um, we're used to giving drugs in our clinics and we're used to managing toxicities and serious toxicities in our clinics. Uh, we did have to do a lot of education about, um, about uh, the, the toxicities and recognizing those, not only with just our physicians, but had, we created some education for other providers as well so that they could recognize that, you know, patient on immunotherapy with diarrhea, they need to call us rather than just trying to manage it themselves, um, although they should be calling us anyway um, for those things. Um, but anyway, you know, we had to really think about how do we manage uh, those patients and those toxicities well. Uh, CAR T cell therapy is very different um, because it is such a specialized therapy. It really needs to be done in centers that have expertise and excellence in managing those types of therapies because it is such a specialized therapy that can be very toxic if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so we do have a CAR T cell center within Texas Oncology, but it is our transplant center um, who have done significant work in clinical trials with CAR T cells already. Um, and we feel very comfortable with them doing it. As CAR Ts become more outpatient, which there's a lot of trials looking at outpatient CAR T, um, we're going to have to develop some rigor around um, access to that internally um, because we want to make sure that our physicians who do those therapies um, understand and manage those well. Um, but it, it, is, it is challenging um, to move things out into the, into the real world, especially with therapies that have a unique toxicity profiles that physicians don't understand, or not, not just understand. They're not used to dealing with those toxicities. Got it. Don, John, did you need to add anything to that? Uh, I don't think so. No. You're agreeing. Okay, very Absolutely. clearly. Okay. <laughs> um, in a minute or two, we're going to ask Jen Malin why United Healthcare decided to bring this to national attention for a potential national coverage determination. But let's set that up. And I'll go to, back to you, John. Remind the people <laughs> what this therapy costs. I think there are two of them out there. What the therapy itself costs, and are there any other costs that kind of surround the therapeutic costs themselves? Just give us some rough figures. And I want to put that on the table and then set it aside for parallel processing. John? Sure. So. The, the two commercial products right now, I think, cost respectively for the product. Uh, one is $475,000 approximately, I believe. The other one is about $100,000 less than that. 
but they're, they're significant six-figure sums. And those are the costs of the product without any of the associated clinical care that goes alongside that. Now, you know, I'm sure that the, the total sum varies from place to place. And it certainly varies according to what toxicities the patient encounters, whether they require an admission to the intensive care unit and so on. Um, you know, a, a, a ballpark back of the envelope calculation for our center at least would put the, the regular cost certainly in the high eight to nine hundred thousands up to a million dollars. And if it's a complex clinical course with an ICU admission, uh, it could go significantly higher, that one, $1.5 million. I don't know whether um, Dr. Locke would agree with that, but I think yep. it would be in that ballpark. Million and a half bucks, Dr. Locke? Yeah, I think uh, for a complicated case, a patient gets sick and is in the ICU, yep. that's absolutely the case. I, I think I take um, a little, uh, it is true that these patients need to be treated at centers with experience. I think the transplant model offers an opportunity to, to sort of mirror that uh, for CAR T cell patients. and I. I I think more patients can get the therapy. It's true not everyone will get it, but just like with stem cell transplants, more patients can get the therapy. They have to be referred earlier. And as these therapies come out, more centers will get experience. Just like with transplant, you'll always have big tertiary care referral centers. will improve uh, management of toxicities, have new therapies that have reduced toxicities. Um, but right. this cost issue is important because a million dollars is a lot, but if you are curing, let's say, 40% of patients. I, I'm not saying we are, but maybe, right? Maybe that cost is reasonable, right? What's the cost of continuing to put someone in the hospital to give them multiple rounds of chemotherapy again and again and again until they end up on hospice? It is very expensive. Does that get into the million dollar range for the average I, patient? I, I think we need to do some work, but yeah, I suspect it does. And, and, and then the question becomes, if we have these therapies, let's say for myeloma or other diseases, that improve survival by a year or two, does that warrant the same cost, or how do we, how ah. do we reconcile that? Ah, so if it improves life for a year or two, but maybe not more, you're not getting a lot more life years, maybe a little bit of quality of life, so that's an important consideration. These are things we have to think about. Um, and I'm glad you brought up what it costs otherwise. I guess the economists call those cost offsets, so this might cost anywhere from a half a mil to a mil and a half, but it must be offsetting costs that are substantial in at least some patients. So, Jen Malin, remind us what your job is, <laughs> and then tell us why United Healthcare decided to make a move at the national level with Medicare on CAR T. All right. Um, so, I work for United Healthcare. Uh, we insure um, or provide healthcare benefits for around 50 million Americans. Um, in 50 million? 50 million. 50 oh million, okay. So that includes um, commercially insured populations where individuals get their insurance through their employers, but we also um, provide coverage for people through Medicare Advantage plans as well as a number of state Medicaid plans. So, you know, I think the, there's a number of aspects to cost that we've started to talk about that are really important. Um, one being we've talked about the cost of the product, but the typical reimbursement model for um, across the United States for drugs has been that um, we don't reimburse the manufacturer directly as a health plan. We reimburse the hospital and the provider um, practice, um, typically at, at some margin above the cost of the product. Um, so it could be as low as, say, 6% if you're talking Medicare reimbursement, or, um, you know, in, in some hospital contracts, um, especially the elite hospitals that often are centers of excellence, it may be to three to four times what the cost of the product is. Wait, wait, wait. A multiplier three to four times? Yes. Is that a multiplier on the kinds of figures that John quoted? Well, so that's the, that's the potential risk, right, with, this, with new innovations coming out and not having a different payment model. So, you know, that um, margin approach, um, which was started back in the, you know, the early days of Medicare, maybe made sense when you were talking about doxorubicin or 5-FU, but even, um, you know, and it's gotten a lot of focus with CAR T-cell therapy, but there are a number of new innovative therapies that are very expensive, not just CAR-T. So, you know, 
the checkpoint inhibitors that we talk about, the manufacturer's cost, uh, manufacturer's price is just under $20,000 a month. So a multiplier of three to four X is quite a bit on that as well. And then there are, new, there are other new innovative therapies like therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals that are in the range of fifty dollars to $100,000 manufacturer's cost per dose. So, you know, one, one I think, big challenge um, and kind of an elephant in, a room, in the room is what is a reasonable profit margin on administering a drug for a, a practice or a hospital? Um, and, you know, is, is it $20,000 a reasonable administration cost and profit? Is it $100,000? Half a million dollars seems excessive. Uh, well, Jen, but what made United Healthcare write that letter? So the national CMS? coverage, the national coverage dis, um, letter, the letter requesting CMS to open a national coverage determination, is really all about ensuring access. So t um, today, the um, approach to CAR T cell therapy in the Medicare population, any new therapy for Medicare. If there is not a national coverage determination, it is determined locally by the local Medicare carriers, and they make determinations. Um, currently, you know, there's, um, there's not been, I don't believe even yet today, any of the local carriers have made official local coverage determinations, although they are, you know, unofficially covering CAR-T. The challenge within the Medicare population has been because of the very high cost of the product, it's hard within the, the current Medicare reimbursement fee schedule to cover the, the cost of the product. Yep. But then um, we were anticipating that, you know, right now the manufacturers and the hospitals that are perf um, performing CAR-T therapy are pretty much adhering to the FDA labels. Right. But we anticipate that there's going to be interest in, and there will be studies that will show that it's effective outside the FDA label. And so how do we ensure that that's consistently applied across the Medicare population and that we don't see regional variation right. in who gets it and coverage determinations that are made regionally, which for us as a national health plan um, makes it very challenging, right? Because we don't want to see inequities in our in how our members have access to therapy based on either where they live, and then with CAR T, especially, it's problematic because you would have someone who maybe comes from Texas who travels to Florida to get CAR T cell therapy, and then which jurisdiction applies? And can you imagine the physicians at Moffitt? having to look at, like, you know, figuring out for this Medicare patient, we're allowed to treat them, and this one we can't? Yes, and so that is why we're still in the midst of an inflection point here. And just kind of a, a quick couple footnotes on this process that I think are going to pick up on what Jen made yeah. uh, are as follows. Most people don't know that most Medicare coverage decisions are not made at CMS in Baltimore. Right. Most of them are made, as Jen pointed out, by the so-called Medicare administrative contractors, the MACs. And what often happens, and I think what happened in this case, and you're referring to this, is that the MACs may not all view this thing the same way. And so some places a, a therapy might be reimbursed, and some other regions it may not be reimbursed. And if you're the pharma bio companies that make this, it's also kind of risky because in some places it's getting paid for, and some places it's not getting paid for. Now, Sometimes that um, disconnect or that disagreement among Max rises to the point where somebody says, listen, we need a national coverage determination, and a national coverage determination by CMS would apply to the whole country. Guess what? There's a gamble in that. If you're getting paid in some parts of the country and the national coverage determination comes down and says no, that's no for everybody. If it says yes, that's yes for everybody. So if you're Making this stuff and selling it, there's a gamble inherent in that, in, that, in that decision right there. And then there's a group called the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee, which met in August of 2018 to kind of do an analysis and look at this and make some recommendations to, uh, to CMS on this issue. Um, and that led to a memorandum that came out in just last month in February. On February 15th, the memo came out from CMS. It was a proposed decision memorandum on CAR-T therapy coverage. 
They gave a 30-day comment period, which closed just last week on this. I know a lot of interesting comments were submitted for that. And just to kind of jump to one of the parts of the chase, they issued something called a CED, Coverage with Evidence Development, which is kind of saying, okay, we're proposing to pay for this nationally, but only when you're collecting data into patient registries, right? So we're still in, in play here. Uh, quick disclosure, my, I was the former chairman of the MedCAC until several years ago. I did, had nothing to do with it, but just wanted to put that disclosure on the table. I did nothing with CAR-T. So, Jen, yeah. I read the letter that UHC sent to CMS. You didn't mention, the letter had nothing in there about costs, which was quite interesting. It talked well, about variability, but not costs, so what's the angle? Well, I think, again, I think for, for us, really, the primary motivation was ensuring equity of access and having access be right. consistent for our members across the country right. and having our centers of excellence who, you know, who perform CAR-T for both our commercial population as well as Medicare Advantage members have consistency. We also wanted to make sure that there was a process in place you know, as, study, as there was desire to use CAR T cell off label, that there would be nationally recognized criteria. So, even before the off label uses would even occur, you wanted to get set up for that? We wanted, yes, we wanted to have a, a national process in place to be able to do that. And, and we believe that the NCD, as proposed, sets that up. As you'll notice, it includes both FDA labeled indications, but also references the NCCN guidelines as a source for off-label indications. And we believe that the CED, the coverage with evidence development, is important um, both to ensure that there's, con you know, that there's ongoing research um, into the, to how CAR T ther therapy um, performs in the real world, but especially in the Medicare population. Across all of the clinical studies that have been done to date, there are only 10 patients that have been enrolled that were over 65. So there's really very little evidence in the published data to date in that Medicare population. So there's a disconnect there between the data we have and the data the Medicare program needs, is that correct? Right, and I think, in, and that's particularly why it's important to collect um, quality of life data in that population, because it's a vulnerable population. So John, Leyland, Fred, and then Stephanie, John, what are the implications of this national coverage determination hanging in the balance now with coverage and with evidence development? What is this going to mean now? What are the implications of the national coverage determination nationally, along with the CED stuff for patient registry collection? What implications does that have for the future of CAR-T? Good arrangement, not a good arrangement. Well, I, th I think in the short term it's a good arrangement for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one of those uh, would be that I think because of the evidence uh, requirements, it, it's going to mean that at least for now, uh, this treatment is going to uh, remain um, within the bounds of the established stem cell transplant programs for the, mo for the most part. The reason being that they already have the infrastructures in place to collect the necessary data through their fact accreditation and other accreditations. And so I think in the short term, this is going to mean whether it be a big academic center or whether it be a big community-based program right. um, like Texas Oncology, um, the, 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 the knowledge and the expertise is going to be gained at those centers who I think are, are best equipped to do it. So short term, I think this is definitely a, a very good decision. You do think it is. And Leyland, again, you're a community oncology person. Uh, how does it translate into your, your perspective? So I spoke to our director of CAR T cell therapy yesterday. Um, we are not really treating Medicare patients, uh, mainly because the hospital system that we align with for this, uh, this therapy, because you do right now have to have a hospital system you align with, because many of these patients end up in ICU. Um, uh, the organizations don't believe that the national coverage decision covers the actual cost of therapy, and they're not willing to, mm -hmm. to go into a loss for this therapy at this point in time. They're not. They're not. Um, we don't, as a community-based practice, we don't have those additional sources of revenue, grants, other studies, things like that, that some academic medical centers have. And I know it's an issue for academic medical centers as well. I'm sure your CEO's looking at you wondering yep. where all this money's going. Yep. Um, for us, you know, it's a much bigger issue um, 
because we don't have other sources of revenue. Uh, but that's the biggest problem right now is there is a, dis there is a decision out there um, which is great and I do completely agree with you that collect continuing to collect evidence is very important in this pa patient population because we just don't know how they're going to do um, and whether they will have the same benefit as uh, patients who were in the clinical trials that are not typical of the patients that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but it, it's, it's not leading to being able to apply that therapy very well. Thank you very much. Um, and it sounds like the data collection under CED can serve multiple uses then. You can really find out or get as much data as you can gather nationally on the use of the technology in that patient population. Frederick, does this make you feel better or worse about uh, the future CAR-T? <laughs> well, I, I think we're making progress. I want to respond to a couple of things Jen said or add on to that. One, I think in the state of Florida, there has been work done for local coverage. And, and if that's not already enacted, uh, through the government, I believe it will be soon, and you guys can look that up and, and check me on that. Uh, in addition, even in just the Zuma 1 trial, we treated over 10 patients that were over 65. So I think that number is probably a little low, um, and the results are very similar, and you'll see additional data on that at upcoming Congresses. As far as, um, and, and the other thing is profit versus cost. I mean, I, I agree we shouldn't be 5Xing the $400,000 price tag. But you saw about all the infrastructure in the earlier session that it takes to administer these innovative therapies. And so there has to be some allowance for the cost, not just for the care delivery that can't be billed, but also for all the ancillary staff that are necessary to deliver the care and costs that are, are hard to quantify. As far as the, um, the NCD and the, the Medicare um, piece, I think it's important. But what I believe is missing is actual um, mechanism to pay for it. It's one thing to say Medicare, cover this. It needs to be given to patients whether it's on indication or on a clinical trial. It's another thing to actually pay for it. And one of the current issues is that Medicare pays for um, hospitalizations, and I'm not an expert in, in payment issues, but, but really um, uh, through uh, DRG um, payment based upon the diagnosis code. And for lymphoma or leukemia, if you infuse CAR T cell therapy in the hospital, that code is not going to give that hospital enough money to cover the cost of the product. And so um, there's mechanisms to do it outpatient, but as you saw earlier, it's not really safe to do this outpatient. So wait, the coding, the coding doesn't fit now, is that what you're saying? It's, it's the, the process for paying doesn't allow a way for Medicare to actually reimburse enough for the, for the hospitals that are giving the therapy. So it's right. one thing to say, yeah, everybody should get it, but how, who's going to pay? How is that going to work? Because huh. um, we can only do this so long where we're not getting fully paid. Are you getting um, a hit? Are you, taking, are, you, are you getting pushed into the red on this thing? Is that what you're saying? I think, um, well, you've heard, not everywhere is doing it for Medicare patients. Right. And so uh, our hospital is doing it for Medicare patients, but I think we're at a huge risk, and if it doesn't get figured out and figured out really soon, we will not be able to give these treatments to Medicare patients. I'm thinking of Clayton Christensen's definition of disruptive technologies, and this is certainly one you just described perfectly how it's disrupting of the current reimbursement system. It doesn't work. It's broken for that purpose. Stephanie, so listening to all this, you think this is going to be good for patient access and quality of care? How's this going to play out? Yeah, I don't, my difficulty is like an individual, each individual cancer is a different cancer. There's no such thing as two cancers that are the same. So what one patient might require three doses, I, can, I can't really speak to CAR T cell because my expertise is more in immuno-oncology. But um, if one patient might only need three doses of something versus someone who needs, you know, two full years, I need it, I was on a clinical trial for two full years, and then maybe they need to go back on the therapy later. I mean, I just think I get a little nervous when things get so standardized to the point where there's not enough room for individual uh, treatment. Aha. Uh -huh. So, Jen, to what extent is the unfolding experience going to help you, as one of the world's biggest healthcare payers, to still allow personalized patient decision-making and coverage. Dosages, indications, on-label, off-label. How can you use this information to not do uh, a one-size-fits-all solution? So, I mean, I, I think that for us, that's the importance of having um, 
something in place, say, for Medicare, like the coverage to, um, national coverage determination, as well as the, the way we partner with NCCN guidelines. So, you know, um, in, you know, many people here may not remember, but like 15 years ago, there was a kind of a point of view that therapy should only be on label, and that's very restrictive, especially, um, you know, when there's, when you have rare cancers or in unique situations. So I think NCCN guidelines does a great job of keeping up with the, the literature and updating those guidelines. So our coverage criteria are based on NCCN guidelines. And then, you know, the, then the challenge becomes how do you sort out um, reasonable, unique patient circumstances from people who just want to kind of try some, you know, a, a therapy in someone where there's not any evidence that it's going to help them. Okay. Um, and I have to say I'm encouraged, and I think it's quite noteworthy that you have made clear that as a major payer, you are not looking to restrict a therapy to only the on-label FDA-approved indications. You are, in fact, anticipating that there will be off-label uses and trying to come up with a way to account for those, collect data for those, and so forth. So this happens to be a very good instance where a coverage decision does not align with a regulatory decision and might, in this case, even be broader. So that, that's a, a very good thing to know. So where then does this leave us on, with regard to the patient-centeredness, back to you, Stephanie, one thing that I haven't, we haven't asked about yet was, okay, the 375,000, the 475,000, the million, million and a half, what happens to patient out-of-pocket cost? Can you describe at least your experience? I know you're in a clinical trial, but what do you know about where it hits the patient's wallet or pocketbook? Yeah. I was incredibly fortunate because I was in a trial, um, you know, the drug company had paid for the drug and then the, we had philanthropy actually sponsored the, the trial. So the things that were trial related were paid for. The things that were standard of care obviously were up to hopefully my insurance company to cover. So there were situations where um, the proper certifications wouldn't have been made in time for a CT scan, and then I would be hit with, you know, a $500 penalty for my insurance company, and then I'm on the phone trying to argue with both uh, the hospital and the insurance company. But I, by and large, I was incredibly fortunate that most of my costs in the trial were paid for, and I think that's one of the incredible things of also being in a trial when that situation um, is available to you and when that's the way it's set up. But I do know of many, many patients who are not able to receive this kind of care because they're either not eligible for trials, because obviously those criteria are incredibly specific, um, or they aren't able to get the off-label use and people can't access these drugs. So mm. my experience, I'm incredibly lucky um, and everything was pretty much taken care of. Obviously the co-pays and whatnot that are out of my pocket, but that, would, that was the same thing when I was receiving chemotherapy. So not only is it a question of access in the first place, right. and there are hurdles to that, maybe even barriers to that, but if you gain access, at least physically access, physical access to the therapy, there's a question of, can I afford this? And I heard you say you were arguing on the phone with people about maybe 500 bucks or more for what you had to throw it out of pocket, right. correct? Right. Leyland, back to the community again and your patients, how does this filter down to the patient experience on the financial side? That's a great question. And I, pretty much every new drug out there is expensive. Um, you know, everything that's approved lately is $10,000 plus a month. Uh, so when we talk about patient co-pays and high deductible plans being five, $6,000, $7,500 for patient out-of-pockets, they meet that the first month of therapy. Um, I will tell you, every January is a challenge in our practices because that's when most people's deductibles reset. And so every January, um, we actually have to get SWAT teams to come in. Um, when I say SWAT teams, we get our nurses out of clinical duties and things like that so we can help our patients figure out how do we meet our deductibles for this year. Um, and the little known secret out there, um, if a patient doesn't pay their deductible, guess who actually has to cover that cost? It's me. Um, you know, the practices are the ones that actually have to collect the money as a bill collector uh, for people who don't collect their co-pays. So we have to get very creative at how do we do this and manage our patient populations and make sure that they have access to care uh, while we still can keep our lights on. Um, so that's a big, huge challenge for us. Um, but pretty much after that, uh, with most, most plans, at least right now, 
uh, since CAPS went away and things. Uh, once, once they've met their deductibles, we ha do have access to that care. Um, and there is uh, patient assistance programs and other things like that that help. You know, there's some controversies around those as well. Um, but most of our patients, we can get access to the care that they need. Um, but it takes work to get there. Malin, so Frederick already said that they're concerned about the cost that their institution may incur. Are you seeing, are you, is your institution at risk for some of these costs if this issue is not resolved more broadly? The payment issue? We are, and we do see that. And we, we, ha we spend a lot of time making sure that we get the right authorizations in place, uh, making sure that we understand the coverage decisions from our different payer partners uh, to make sure that we do get the, those payments in. So we, we have quite a few staff, um, significant number of staff that that's what they do for us. It's not patient care related. It's making sure that we get uh, payment for the things that we provide. Um, because as it, you know, in a community-based setting, the way that we, the way it works is we buy the drugs, we infuse the drugs, and then we get payment from the payers after that. Uh, so we are at risk um, for, we do have to manage that very carefully. Um, to make sure that we don't put ourselves at risk. If CAR T cell comes into the outpatient world, and now all of a sudden I'm having to spend four hundred thousand dollars for a vial of drug, um, we talked. We were joking in a meeting one day about having a golden pillow um, in a glass case um, for that therapy, uh, because we can't actually bill anyone for it until we infuse it into a patient. Um, so, so you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens when a drug that's that expensive comes into the outpatient world. I have a feeling that that vial or that pill is going to be more costing the whole golden pillow at some point. Exactly. Talk about expense. <laughs> exactly. John, are you seeing the same sort of thing as so far as downside financial risk? Yeah, I, I think you know, one of the things which maybe isn't discussed quite so much as well is that there, there are some hidden costs. We talk a lot about the cost. Hidden costs. The, yeah, we talk a lot about the cost of the drug, but, but just as one specific example, and this is in the uh, checkpoint inhibitor world, not in the CAR-T world, uh, you know, I, probably the most frequent call I get uh, re rep repetitive call I get is asking if what the hospital, our hospital can cover the cost of inpatient infliximab oh. for a patient who develops colitis secondary to a checkpoint inhibitor. So I think, you know, those costs of, um, you know, visits to our acute care clinic, endoscopy, admissions to the hospital, uh, Remicade infusion, those are costs that no, don't typically, yeah, get factored into the cost with the cost of the drug. And we're at risk for those costs for sure, which can be pretty significant. Aha. Uh -huh. Jen, as part of the MedCAC deliberations in August mm -hmm. and the discussion since, there was a really great focus, large focus on PROs, patient reported outcomes. And I think that they were calling for the so-called promise set of outcomes and perhaps another. Can you describe from your standpoint the significance of the PROs here? I'm going to ask John as well, because I know he's looked at this carefully. Tell us about the PRO role in this NCD. Well, I, I mean, I think the, the focus for MedCAC was really, you know, wanting to make sure that um, people weren't just surviving longer with CAR T cell therapy, but they were thriving. And, you know... Um, surviving? Not just surviving, but thriving. Right. And they actually care about this thrive right. part. Right. Apparently. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the importance of having some measure of patient reported outcomes. And, you know, as over time, given that this is a complex therapy, um, you know, the health, what the healthcare delivery system does and all of the services that wrap around providing that therapy are likely going to make the difference in PROs. So how are we going to know um, which, you know, which additional um, supportive care products or which um, approaches to, you know, having people, you know, get the therapy, you know, a week before, you know, all the different permutations that could be involved. How will we be able to know which of those produce the best outcomes for the patients as opposed to just surviving a year if we're not collecting the data? So you're, you work for an insurance company mm -hmm. and You've got a, you, actuaries and accountants, and you're all responsible for the top line and the bottom line. How does an insurance company figure in PROs to your calculus? Well, I mean, I, I would say we as an insurance company don't directly look at it, but for example, you know, we, um, you know, w with our approach to CAR T cell therapy, we are treating it like we treat a transplant. 
So it's, um, we provide it for our members through our Centers of Excellence for Transplant. They are fact accredited. They also happen to essentially be the ones that the manufacturers have accredited for the FDA guidance. So there's a lot of consistency right now, but through that, um, through the selection process of our COEs, we look at their outcomes. So for us, it would be looking at the individual center outcomes. And then, you know, you know, I would imagine that through, you know, as NCCN committees meet to deliberate, you know, other organizations that look at outcomes of these um, agents, that will factor into guidelines as well. So there's kind of a multi, you know, we as an insurance company aren't looking at the PRO data directly ourselves, but it's making sure that it's part of the, um, the deliberation process of the, you know, the network of providers that we contract with, that that's, you know, that that's a priority. So it is part there. Thank you. John, make that distinction between the so-called clinical outcomes and the PROs and why they're important here. Yeah, I, there are a number of reasons. I'm not sure whether uh, Wally Akeley is in the room or Shivan Patel at Huntsman, but they've done a, a lot of work on patient reported outcomes in our clinic in general. And what I would say is don't underestimate the importance of PROs because it may go well beyond the quality of life issues that we typically think of. So, for example, uh, Wally has some data that suggests that in some patients with advanced cancer, patient reported outcomes predict survival, overall survival. The PROs predict survival. Right. And, and, you know, if we could get to the point where, you know, we can actually be using patient reported outcomes. In a, as a selection tool right up front, maybe for eligibility for clinical trials. Wait, wait, so, so as a selection tool up front, before enrollment, before therapy starts? I think potentially what we've seen is that for, for some patients with advanced cancer, we can predict median survivals, which are measurable in a few months. Uh, and that then raises the question as to what's the most appropriate approach and goal of care for that particular patient. So I think that there is a sort of untapped potential for patient reported outcomes, and we may see all kinds of implications in terms of eligibility, as I mentioned, for a clinical trial, a specific treatment. Um, so I think it could go well beyond a quality of life issue. Very important. Um, in about two minutes, we'll be glad to take some questions. And if you've got a question, we've got mics, floor mics in both aisles. Uh, so if you want to offer that in a few minutes, we'll be glad to take a few. Stephanie, patient reported outcomes, can you talk a little bit about the distinction between what a clinician might seek or an investigator and what you as a patient might be wanting to express about your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is so, so, so important. Um, I think until patients are seen as co-investigators, then we're really limiting the scope and the depth of our investigation. Patient um, as co-investigator? Absolutely. Great concept. <laughs> Wow. I think the patient is the one with the disease. I think we know what our experiences are, what we're going through, and when we're only being asked a certain limited amount of questions that are very specific, then we're completely limiting um, what possibly could be coming forward, right? Like what, what kind of data is actually there? So I know that from my experience, I was very frustrated because I would experience side effects that to the investigators maybe weren't top priority, but that I feel are really important to get on the record, right? Because these are entirely new drugs. They're entirely new modalities. How do we know what's going to happen in 10, 20 years? So I think that's an incredibly important piece of this. Um, and I just think that until we really treat patients as partners, which they are, then we're really selling ourselves short. That is a great concept. Patient is partner and patient is co-investigator. It's the first time I ever heard that. Let's take that home. As we proceed, I'm going to go to questions in a minute. Please keep in mind something about the big picture here. When you've considered who are the main players who are pushing buttons, having leverage, having influence, we've heard the pharma bio companies, the Food and Drug Administration, the clinicians, the payers, the patients. So at least five big players in here, all of whom have key roles as gatekeepers or other decision makers. Everybody's involved. And I don't want to leave off the side when I say providers. NCCN in particular was mentioned insofar as its guidelines. And I know Jen referred to how her decision making 
might be influenced by what NCCN decides to put in the guideline, whether on-label or off-label. Please keep that in mind. I see for questions in the following order, microphone two, three, one, and four. Questions rather than speeches are preferred. Microphone two. Yes, um, Sam Silver, University of Michigan. Thank you. Again, a wonderful uh, presentation uh, uh, and discussion. Uh, I usually don't disagree with uh, John and, uh, and Jennifer, but on the NCD, I think I do. And I, I, uh, I'm uh, uh, chair of the reimbursement committee for the American Society of Hematology, and obviously we've, we've, thought, we've thought a lot about this. Uh, uh, the, the devil's always in the details. And, and access, of course, is a paramount issue. And maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I've interpreted this wrong, and I want to hear from Cliff, and, but um, uh, in, uh, uh, providers can opt out of not doing um, CEDs, and therefore uh, take Medicare recipients or Medicare beneficiaries off of their potential panel to get this medication. The very fact that, um, uh, that uh, we're so far in the red every time we do a Medicare patient, there are a lot of providers that are looking for this very out. So, okay. so saying that, well, we're not gonna, we, we can't afford to do all these CED stuff, so we're just not going to do it. Okay, so, thanks, Sam. Just Excellent question. Is there an off-ramp for providers on this issue? Any panelists have a, have a comment on that? Any off-ramp here? Jen? Well, I, I think what, what um, Sam is saying is that um, providers will decide not to even offer it to Medicare patients, which many are doing today for Medicare fee-for-service because you're underwater on the reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, so maybe I'm being... Um, naive, but my, I think that with this requirement in the CED, that it, for CED, it will essentially require setting up the funding mechanisms to support the evidence, you know, the collection of data for, C, for the coverage with evidence development, both um, through CIBMTR, so through kind of some public funding, as well as I think the manufacturers will have a vested interest in ensuring yeah. that there's funding for data collection. Point well taken. Thanks, Sam. Good question. Very practical. Microphone three, your name, please. Hamed Mirzai. Thank you very much, the panel. Uh, this was quite educational. Um, Jen's comments started with profits. And I find it quite enlightened that in today's world, that still is fundamentally the first thing that we have to think about before providing care. With that in mind, what is the acceptable profit margin for insurance providers? Uh, I was just Googling very quickly. United Health marked $100 billion in revenues at the end of 2018, and then we're discussing margins of half a million dollars for a subpopulation where you mentioned you cover, or not you, United Healthcare covers 50 million Americans. So how much do we generate in revenue there to be able to accommodate patients that need these novel therapies. Thank you. Jen, I don't know if you've got, do you have a, a margin figure for United um, or what? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not as, as up on the quarterly. You, you may, you may re know this better than I do. I think typically um, United's profit margin is around 4 to 5 percent, so much lower than, say, a, a pharma manufacturer. Um, you know, hospital, even non, not-for-profit hospitals, um, they don't re it sort of as profit, but they're, you know, they're operating um, kind of net operating, you know, net revenue after operating costs or whatever it gets reported as for not-for-profit can range substantially. I mean, some hospitals obviously have very tight margins, and others may actually be in more in the 30 to 40 percent um, of, you know, revenue left after operating costs. Okay. So I think, you know, I think the, the question really is, is an important one, not, um, you know, is across the board, what's a, what's a reasonable, um, you know, profit, for, for lack of a better word, across the healthcare system? Well, I don't know if we have the hard answer for you, but I'm very, we are very glad you raised the question, and I'm wondering why Frederick Locke was just shaking his head vigorously. Well, I, I don't know that we release what our, we're a nonprofit hospital, but it is lower than what you quoted for United Healthcare, I'm certain. 
um, for the for the margin. Um, and again, I think that word profit is is the wrong word. Um, the three x or five x model for marking up the product might be a way for one hospital to cover the loss of the Medicare products that we're we're eating. So that's not a profit. That's a way to ensure we're treating more patients in a company make, I forget what number you said, but it sounds like a lot of money. So it seems like there's money to do that. And, and so I, I think profit is the wrong word. And I, I, I also think that it's true what you, you answer the question, how we're going to use, uh, we're going to have payment probably from the, from the pharmaceutical companies to do the data collection through CIVMTR and probably even the patient reported outcomes. But that doesn't mean they're going to pay for the product for Medicare patients. That's the real issue is the okay. big price tag. I, I Fair point, say, Jen. Yeah, I just want to clarify too though as well, you know, it's, it's kind of um, thinking about who is ultimately paying for um, the, the health care, right? So it ends up being employers and employees and even for United Healthcare's commercial population, our fully insured population, so the ones that we're financially at risk for, is about 25% of our commercial members. 75% of those members are self-insured. And so this represents like your local school district. And so getting, you know, it's very hard for me to sit down and explain to, you know, an employer who's self-insured why, you know, while, you know, they can Google that the cost of the drug is $20,000 at Medicare rates, and why is my insured getting billed $100,000 for this? And then, you know, CAR-T, you know, to, to have a, a bill for an individual member, if you're an employer and you're self-insured, self of several million dollars, you know, that could be half of your, you know, budget and having to, you know, cut expenses for students. So yep. These have real, you know, there's an inequity across the healthcare system when you cost shift on, you know, onto particular situations like that. Thank you, Jen. Like Thank you for kicking that particular hornet's nest, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone one. Hi, uh, Amy Fendrick. I'm a medical director actually for one of the Blue Cross plans. Um, so I'm not sure that there's even a question, but I think that part of what's missing on the panel is big pharma. And, and you know, where does that come in? We're talking about who's going to pay. But I think, you know, if we just back it way up, um, what do we do about the cost? Um, the cost you know, or the price? The, the price because who's really, you know, who's setting this cost? And, and, and that is really what's limiting the ability to make the, the you know, the, the treatment available for, for patients like uh, Stephanie or Dr. Backer or, you know, people that, that need these things. Well, thank you very much for raising the question. I must say, and I hope NCCN doesn't mind my saying this, uh, NCCN tried really hard to have a pharma bio person on the panel. I think they did have a, such a person, but for some per reason that I don't know, they were unable to join, and NCCN tried again. So the effort was made. No, and, 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 I, and I understand that, but Big Pharma doesn't want to sit at this table. Oh, yeah. That, that is the reality. Were they sitting at the table, <laughs> I'm going to channel my pharma bio friends, and they would say, listen, R&D costs are very, very high. This thing's going to have a patent life a certain number of years. We have to reinvest in R&D. It may sound like it has a high uh, shelf price or price tag, but the offset cost may be even higher. So those are the first three things you might hear, and they're part of a legitimate argument. But thank you for putting that on the table as well for a, yet another conversation. Uh, we are back to microphone four was the next person. Brief question, yes. Yes. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Rahul Banerjee, I'm a first year fellow at UCSF. Thank you. This has been a very helpful talk. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be defending pharma or not. I have no disclosures. Uh, a distant memory from a year ago is when Novartis was considering um, like outcome-based contracts, so like a money-back guarantee, so to speak, for, for Tizaj and Leclusil, to be fair, mainly for leukemia when the response rates are higher. I think that plan is gone, not being moved forward, but I'm just curious to hear if you think there's a future for um, clinical outcome-based repayments or like the money-back guarantee, so to speak, for lymphoma or for CAR T cells in general. Thank you for raising the question. In fact, you referred to something related was the, uh, there was an arrangement uh, between CMS and one of the biopharma companies with one of the leading products here that was based on, I think, a 30-day outcome 
and for various reasons, scientific and otherwise, that uh, arrangement was withdrawn. But uh, offers on the alternative payment approach here for outcomes-based contracting, VBCs. So, uh, I would just Frederick? say I, that, that alternative-based payment model is in effect with some individual healthcare systems for the ALL product, Tisogen like Lucille. It, it is true that the CMS agreement kind of disappeared maybe for political reasons, but I, I'm not sure that it's a real accurate measure of utility of the therapy. I think, you know, 90% of patients respond within 30 days. So how much are you really refunding? It's not uh, really a measure of ongoing response. John, did you have a comment on the 30-day thing? In well, no, I mean, my comment would be that I think that the kind of money get money back guarantee um, um, concept is, is good in pediatric ALL, or perhaps in ALL in general, when you move that into uh, something like relapsed aggressive lymphoma, where the response rates are not so good. I just don't see it happening. Frankly. Ah, um, good. <laughs> well, thank you for raising that. There are a lot of alternative payment models in play now, <clears throat> including for orphan products and ultra-orphan products. How do we kind of, who writes the check for $2 million for gene therapy, for example? A lot of innovations going on in that area as well, as was suggested by our panelists. Thank you very much for bringing that up. In the order in which I saw them, we would go now to microphone two, followed by microphone five. Microphone two, sir. Uh, Andrew Zellin, it's Memorial Sloan Kettering and the B cell lymphoma panel. Um, so I <clears throat> have some involvement with this therapy. Um, but I, specifically, John, I, um, I really like the idea of PRO directed um, uh, protocol eligibility screening. But one of the things we have to be really careful about is that it's a biomarker. It's like, are you EGF mutated? Are you, you know, um, do you have a MyD88 mutation? And whereas we can control our historical data sets for many of the biomarkers, when, if we just introduce PRO restriction to clinical trials, how do we correct the historical record so that we can actually interpret, because remember, it's going to be the Oki phenomenon. Those patients are, all of a sudden, the trials are going to be better. Oh, this new trial worked, even though it's no different. Thank you for the question, Dr. Zelnitz. John, you want to take a go at that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I can give a good answer. I mean, a, a couple of observations would be, number one, you know, we, in, in terms of our determining eligibility in the past, we've, we've always relied on performance status as assessed by us. Um, and I think it's probably or possibly true that patients will be better at telling us how, how fit they are than we are at judging it. Um, but, but your point's well taken. I think, I think the other potential pitfall is that once patients are aware that the way they respond to PRO questionnaires has the potential to affect what treatment they get, that may be a modifier that's going to affect the way that they respond to the questionnaires. Ah. So, you know, I, I, I think uh, Dr. Zellner's points were well taken. Very helpful. Frederick, did you want to add anything on that particular issue? No, no, I think it's an interesting, uh, inter interesting discussion. But. Okay, good, thank you. Next is microphone five, thank you. Hi, my name, my name is Sheila Smith, Jean Banco, clinical director for World Trade Center Health Program in New York City. Um, my uh, point is, first of all, it's Stephanie brought up Stephanie is our next generation of advocates um, who really is proactive. I have a daughter just like her, and one of the things that she said that they failed in the tax reform bills was to increase the flexible spending so that it was a law that can really help people plan ahead with expenses. The max is capped at 2700 which people use up in one or two months, and then the rest is all they're out of pocket. If a young person making a great salary had an opportunity to put aside expenses or even have family members transfer their flexible spending without a tax penalty. This would be an advantage to help control costs and keep people in care. And something should be considered as an overall group. Thank you for the point. Very, very well taken. Any response to that, Stephanie? Sound right? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think we're not setting ourselves up for success here. Um, I don't know enough about that specifically to, to speak on it, but um, 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the more that we can be prepared for these things, um, the better. And I also want to correct myself when I said that there were these $500 fees and whatnot. It doesn't mean that the cost of my cancer care didn't accrue significantly oh, throughout, right? I just meant that I was fortunate enough not to have to pay like $20,000 out of pocket for an infusion of Pembro. Um, but these costs are significant. And beyond that, the right, I was unable to work, all these things that are just practical costs. So I, I completely agree with you, and I appreciate that comment. Thank you. And you still had to fork over the 500, though. Yeah, I still had to fork three times. Easy. Right. Coming out of college, first job, sure. Three times. And our final question from the floor at microphone one. Yes, hi. My name is Darlene Horton from Coherence Biosciences in Redwood City, California. Uh, I admit that I'm biased as I ask this question, um, and that is about the emergence of biosimilars. There are currently, I think, around 10 that have been approved. There's maybe a real difference in how they are perceived if they are a curative uh, monoclonal antibody versus supportive care, such as pegfulgrastum. Uh, and there's an enormous learning curve that uh, oncologists and uh, healthcare pra practitioners uh, need to come up on for sure. That said, it seems like the insurance companies are far more receptive to biosimilars just at the outset here. Um, but it seems like we are at the base of a very huge wave mm -hmm. that could save our healthcare system uh, many billions of dollars. Good. Thank you very much. Um, on that issue briefly, Frederick, and then yeah, perhaps Jen I, if she chooses. I, I agree it could reduce costs, but we've, uh, I just had a conversation yesterday about this. One of the things we're seeing is that different insurers are mandating, just like the growth factors, which biosimilar we use, and there's a huge hidden cost to uh, our delivery of care when we have to like figure out which one we use for which patient. And, and so I don't know how we're going to cover that cost, but it, it, it may be reducing the price tag of the drug, but there's a big cost behind that if we're... Indeed. Jen, anything to add on biosims before I mean, we move on? I would just say I think there's, you know, um, there's potential, right? You know, when, when generics get introduced, the, the cost of, you know, of having a, you know, when there's a generic alternative, the, the cost of therapies come down quite a bit. With biosimilars, I would say so far it's been rather disappointing. I think the cost decrease has been more in the range of 10%, which is, you know, and in the, in the setting of huge price increases over the last decade or two decades for some of these products. And, um, and then I would just say even, even in another setting with the checkpoint inhibitors, there's now six checkpoint inhibitors on the market. You would think if we had a functioning market that there would be some price competition there and haven't really seen any drops. Point well taken. We only have like two minutes left. I'm going to put a little pressure on our panelists here. We're going to go audience right to left starting with Leilon and, and ending up here with, with Stephanie. So we learned a heck of a lot just now in the last 75 or so minutes about CAR-T. I thought I knew a lot, and I didn't, because I learned so much from what you all just said. Take it a step above to a meta level, Leyland. Same question for everybody. If we sit back on the CAR-T experience and kind of look at it big picture, what lesson, one single lesson, would you draw from the CAR-T experience now that would apply more broadly to advancing innovative cancer therapies that actually have an impact on patient outcomes. In other words, is there a take-home lesson from what we're living through now with CAR-T that could be applied more broadly to the work that these people do every day? Leyland, not more than a sentence. What would be one lesson you would draw? He's a brave guy. He's going first. Leyland. Usually you ask me last, and now I'm first, so it's, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think the lesson learned would be as we develop these therapies, uh, you know, the better you identify the patient population that benefits, the more likely you are to be able to cover that from financially. Um, so if we knew the 30% of people that were going to respond to CAR-T long term, uh, you'd have a much better time covering that population versus the 70% that don't. Um, so I think that's one, one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is really thinking about as these products are developed, the total continuum of care and what that looks like for patients. Uh, so as products are developed, that you're not just thinking about getting your product approved, but you're thinking about, I need to get my product approved, and what effect is that going to have on this patient ah, long term? Excellent. Um, and the total cost of care. And those are two things, but that's okay. 
They were both good. John, what's your one thing? One lesson. Uh, take a holistic approach to the true cost of a new intervention uh, over and above the actual agent, but also the uh, cost of managing toxicity. This is a great case study for your point well taken. What do you got uh, there, Jen? One thing. Um, I mean, I would say, in, you know, at least from our experience at United Healthcare, we actually have felt like that the, um, that the adoption of CAR-T so far has actually kind of been a, a good case study in how to do it right. That, you know, we've had good collaboration with our centers of excellence. Um, we haven't had challenges with getting people access. Um, you know, we, we you know, feel like we have a system in place now where, you know, we're optimistic. Mm -hmm. that the NCD will provide better access. You know, we, we completely understand and agree with the challenges that have been raised so far, but, um, but we feel like this potentially is a model of, that, of how we can, can bring innovative therapies to the market. CAR-T therapy, how to do it right. Thank you very much, Jen and Frederick. Yeah, so the, the price tag is expensive, but as healthcare providers, that should not stop you from referring your patients. You're an advocate for your patients. You need to get them to centers where the therapy can be delivered. I, I would agree. We have not yet seen a denial from a payer for an appropriate patient for CAR-T cell therapy. Uh -huh. So do not let the cost scare you. Get your patient early and often to the center where they can get the appropriate therapy. A heartfelt finding at that. Thank you very much, Frederick. Well, what do you have, Stephanie? What's your lesson for us? Okay, I think the lesson today there's many, but um, I think it takes a team for these innovative therapies to be successful, and that means anything from side effects, so the ER docs, to your physician, to the nurses, the coordinators, the care partners, the patients. It really takes a team um, for these treatments to be successful and for patients to stay on treatment well. Perfect lesson for this, and I'll never forget the patient co-investigator as part of the team. <laughs> In a moment, but not right now, in a moment we're going to take our break before uh, going down the hall for a while and then coming back a little later this morning. Um, i got to tell you, I learned a lot today about CAR-T therapy. We very much appreciate all the input you've had. And so for Stephanie Jove, Frederick Locke, Jennifer Malin, John Sweetnam, and Leyland Wilfong, please do join me in thanking them for the great contribution they've made. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.